Hello and welcome to Silax, the podcast where we talk about scientific developments and technological changes in Luxembourg, as usual, proudly powered by Research Luxembourg and recording at the Media Center of the University of Luxembourg. And in today's show, we have two guests, uh, one here in Luxembourg, the other one in the UK. And the first guest in Luxembourg is Aurélie Poli, who is Senior Scientist at Neuroimmunology Group at the Department of Cancer Research, Luxembourg Institute of Health. Her research focuses on the understanding of the epidemiological association between glioma development and pre-existing history of allergy. So there will be a lot of cancer and allergy discussed together. And then we have Heather Bax, who is Postdoctoral Research Fellow at King's College London, And she focuses on developing novel antibodies of the IgE class to target solid tumors. Ladies, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. So I mentioned already allergo oncology, kind of, because I said allergy and oncology and cancer. So we have to start with that. The first definition in our show is going to be that. Aurélie, what is allergo oncology? So thank you for asking this important question at the beginning of the podcast, because we are here to dig into this uh, exciting and emerging field of research. So it's a concept that was founded in uh, 2010 by uh, Professor uh, Erika jensen Jarolim from the University of uh, Medicine in Vienna, in Austria. And it's based on long-lasting epidemiological studies that show for many concerns that Having an history of allergy may influence the risk of development of any kind of cancer, and we can dig maybe better into this later. So we have a working group, so a European working group that is also implication of more international scientists and doctors, and uh, we all together would like to further decipher into this association because it's interesting to understand or allergy could be protective or inducing the risk of cancer because if we can understand on the immunological mechanism behind, we think that we can explore on innovative therapeutics to help patients with cancer. And this is where you come in, Heather, right? This this working group that Aurélie mentioned, you are working together. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I've been part of the working group since 2014 and Aurélie, I think a similar time with known each other for quite a number of years now and everyone brings different levels of expertise and background there's clinicians there's scientists allergists oncologists all coming together what i was wondering about is that one of the things when you're in the introduction to what you do is uh, that you look at antibodies and i don't necessarily know what is the relationship between allergies and antibodies and and cancer how does it all fit in the human bodies as part of our immune system we we generate five different antibodies and one of those is called IgE and that really is well known to have key roles in allergy and allergic diseases and and we're going to say IgE many many times today so they're one of the the key antibodies that we're looking at IG is, is the immunoglobulin E, right? That's probably you never pronounce because it's a tongue twister a little bit. And basically what I understand is that if you have a suspicion to have an allergy, one of the classic tests is actually to check the presence of Ig, right? Correct, yes. So they're looking at in patient serum, looking at total IgE and also allergen specific IgE. So total Ig will be all of the different Ig that that individual has in their body. Allergen specific is the Ig that's been generated specifically in response to exposure to a single allergen. So for example, grass, a type of grass pollen or cat fur or peanut. And you mentioned that we have allergy and cancer and we have the relationship and you're going to develop it further. So go deeper, Aurélie. So what did you mean with that? Because I started reading and I'm a bit confused because in a way I see studies that say, oh, there is like a direct relationship, allergies, let's say, help for not developing cancer, but it's not so clear, right? It's not one or zero. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly the point and why we are all working together to decipher better on the mechanism. So it's interesting to to know that there is more than 400 epidemiological studies that link allergy to cancer risk. So this risk could be negative or positive. So what we see generally that the allergy is protective 
to cancer that develop far from the site of the allergy. So, for example, allergy is protective against the risk of development of brain tumor, what I'm interested in too. And on the other side, we see that allergy could be a risk factor for allergy that develop in the lung where you have, for example, history of allergic asthma. So overall, we agree that allergy is protective on the site, far from the site of allergy of the cancer and positively associated when it's on the organ where the allergy provokes symptoms. Yes, exactly. So I think Aureli is talking about this is so broad, it's very, very specific depending on what allergy we're talking about and what cancer we're talking about. I've had already quite a few specialists in and allergies and in cancer. And of course, at certain moment, we discuss, you know, all the environmental factors, or we try to discuss the childhood or, you know, all these different studies that are trying to pinpoint certain sources of these diseases. And here, what we're doing is actually not only looking at the sources, but also saying, well, they are interrelated. And this is very fascinating for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How are they associated? And association doesn't always mean causation, of course. And, yes. and this is one of our huge challenges, is to dissect the specifics about what allergy, what cancer, and how they're interrelated. And that's what Aureli's really been needing most recently. There is already some uh, hypothesis based on this association. So what we can say based on your question that you could see that when you have allergy, you are coughing, sneezing. And when it comes to this contact with a possible carcinogen, so what is creating an impact on your cell that then become cancerous cells, having this allergic symptom could get rid of the exposure. This is what we call the prophylaxis mechanism. This is one possible thing. The second thing is our body every day has to deal with emerging cancerous cells. And we have our body guardians, the immune system, that take care of it really well. So normally our immunity is taking care and clearing the danger. And for one or another re reason, this mechanism is failing and then the development of the tumor occur. So this is where when we think of the risk, we can think that allergy favor our immune body response to attack the emerging cancer. This is one of the hypotheses for the protective feature of allergy. And then when we think of, oh, allergy could be detrimental is that Having a massive inflammation in the lung, for example, is also known to be a cause of the development of uh, neoplastic cells, so cancerous cells. So this is where we can see that there is a balance and where it is decisive to elucidate for each specific cancer type what could be the mechanism, what is it protective and what is it detrimental. Of course. And you mentioned the immune system. So I was just uh, thinking to go back to, to, to our beginning of the discussion. So, you know, in general, antibodies. So you said five antibodies that the human body produces. OK, I remember it well. And there is one that you really looked at, which is MOV18 IgE. That's a human one or it's a, a created one it's a outside created, of the human. OK. Okay, yeah. so that's all the additional antibodies to fight certain diseases, right? Okay, so let's go first for the ones we have in the body. W what is the state of the research? What are you looking at? Don't we already know everything about the antibodies in our body? Absolutely not. I mean, and I think the challenge with IgE is that it's less than 0.05%, so less than half a percent of the serum immunoglobulins that a human has. What we know about IgE is that it's involved in allergic responses, fighting parasites, but we don't really think about it in terms of cancer. Yes, there's, there is research looking at some of the other antibodies, IgG, for instance, which makes up about 75% of immunoglobulins in the serum. And I think there is a lot of research by other groups showing that there are responses that the patient's own immune systems can generate antibodies against the cancers that they have. But clearly, that's not an effective enough response when it comes to oncology. And that's why we're trying to develop new treatments. And there's a huge range of antibody treatments that are being developed. A lot of them are IgG. It's so much more widely understood 
and has become sort of the norm. Uh, but many different approaches, even with Ig antibodies or antibodies with an IgG backbone, as we would say. So what we're trying to do to to understand IgE and its role in allergy, and to determine whether we can recapitulate those functions and direct it specifically against cancer, it's really we're breaking new ground. We're one of very few groups doing it, and we've had to start right from the beginning in in doing that. Okay, so now is the moment to tell us more about it. If you're yes. breaking the grounds, I want to know more. So yes, so move. I mean, really, when you come up with all those names, ah. I always have such a problem. Is it Mauve, Movi, we Mo, say, whatever, 18? We say yeah. Mov 18. Okay. And it's actually mouse ovarian 18, where it's derived. And this is a monoclonal antibody. It's chimeric and it's specific for a tumor-associated antigen called folate receptor alpha. And I know I've said lots of terms there which I'm very happy to, yes, to totally. talk to. Yes, totally. Please explain. So mono- you start with chimeric, I okay. think. Oh, no, actually, yes, you're right. The first one, mono... Monoclonal. Mono yes. So monoclonal means that when we generate a solution of that antibody, every single Ig molecule is identical. It's exactly the same, and it's very specific for a single epitope or if I rephrase a single part of a protein so it's consistent and identical. The next term I think is chimeric. So chimeric relates to the structure of the antibody and I think it's helpful to think of an antibody like a body with two arms. So the arms are the part that make an antibody specific and where it it binds to perhaps a cancer cell. And then the body is where it would bind to effector cells, so receptors on effector cells, cells that your immune system uses. And in being chimeric, the body is human, so it's recognized by the human immune system. But actually those arms, because we it was originally developed as a clone in mice, they're actually murine. But they're murine and they specifically recognize human folate receptor alpha. And I said at the beginning that folate receptor alpha is a tumor-associated antigen. So that means that it's a protein which is expressed by cancer cells. And in our case, it's highly expressed by about 60% of ovarian high-grade serous, which is a type of ovarian um, cancer. And a tumor-associated antigen is, is an antigen, so a protein which is expressed on a cancer cell, but ideally not expressed on normal tissues, on normal cells. And inherently, that is what makes our antibody specific to cancer and able to target cancer. I'm really impressed, Aurelie, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, she did really well. I have to <laughs> no. say congratulations. There was a lot of terms and you really unwrapped all of them. Okay. And the worst is, right, when in, in the scientific knowledge, especially when we're talking about, you know, medical research, is that when you explain one term, you have to introduce new ones. I could see that you were very much trying not to, but it's extremely difficult and very, very interesting. Absolutely. We'll go back to you because I have a already an interest in, in how big the antibodies are, but just, you know, because I'm trying to imagine the sizes and everything. But you mentioned mice. So I thought that we could also discuss a little bit about the groundbreaking research that you you did before all the allergo oncology things that happened. So what did you manage? As far as I understood, you managed to replicate a model that was noticed in human beings in mice. Yes. And what was it? Yes, yes. And I, I actually, uh, we were intrigued by this inverse association that we found between allergy and brain tumor. So a specific brain tumor that we call glioblastoma, that is one of the most aggressive one and doesn't have any cure. So these epidemiological studies really are strong. And we thought, okay, if it's true, we should be able to mirror this in a mouse model. So this is exactly what we published some time ago. And 
und we have used the model of allergy to host dust mites. This is one of the most prevalent allergy worldwide. So we have induced the allergy of the mice and then we have tested the implantation of a brain tumor and it's resulted in a delay of the tumor take. So the engraftment of the tumor is delayed only when we induce the allergy to the mice. So it was really striking to see that What is observed in human could be mirror in mice, and it's now the beginning of a new area of research to understand on the mechanism behind, because now we have a model to really understand what is the mechanism. Ah, so there's a lot to do still. We are very still much a lot in the to beginning. Do, but, uh, you said 20, yeah. mm. when was it when it started? I'll go and call it 20, 2010, right? So 2010, but all the epidemiological studies are back to 50, I think, eh, Eva? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had a look back and I could see the term allergo-oncology was actually first published in 2008. But I think that the group was formally made in 2010. So you have a little bit of the background story. And now, why do you think it's important? We have so many different things already developed when it comes to cancer treatments. Why try another path? Why allergies and oncology? So it's true that the field of immunotherapy, because this is what is the most breakthrough to help patients with cancer, is evolving fast and give great results. Unfortunately, there is part of the patient that do not respond to immunotherapeutics. And it's mainly because the immune system is compromised in the context of cancer. So it's interesting to see that pathology that actually is an overactivation of our immunity. So during allergy, we have an overstimulation of our immune system is actually protecting. So it means that we have natural body defense that may be useful to understand, to develop more impactful immunotherapeutics. Uh, so it's more about kind of strengthening yes. the treatment rather yes. than just using it as a as one and only cure. Yes, especially for those that do not reply because now we have a panel of tools, but we still have to develop new immunotherapeutics to find new targets, so new way of prevention and treatment. Well, I just wanted to add, I mean, I think this is the real benefit of Allergo Oncology and bringing all of us together is that we bring expertise from allergic diseases, we bring in cancer, we bring in clinicians and scientists, and we can come up with novel ideas. We can understand the work that Aureli's been needing and understand what the body's doing in itself and some kind of natural protective effects of IG and then take that and say, what do we know about IG? What does it do in allergy? What are the potent functions that it has? Can we utilize them, create a therapy with IG and direct it very specifically against cancer? And I think it's really important to understand that we're not proposing any of these next steps as a miracle cure or what will be appropriate to every single patient, especially in oncology. Patients have numerous lines of treatment. They might respond and then become resistant. Patients might not respond to some treatments but others. And so we really want to develop therapies that have different mechanisms of action that utilize the patient's own immune system differentially because that might be more successful in some patients than others and really have a, the biggest toolkit we possibly can uh, for clinicians to use with their patients. This is a very, very precious point, and this is also often a subject, actually, of a discussion here in the podcast is, first of all, this going out of your silos, let's say, and, uh, you know, interdisciplinary work that is basically now at the ground of, of all, in my opinion, quality science. And it's just the only way forward is to actually try to find as big group as possible, include people in the discussion and develop new novel treatments, novel ideas together, which is not easy, I know. That's why the, probably humanity hasn't been doing it that much, but small steps. We, we have to believe in that. And talking of small steps, I was just thinking that probably it's actually a very long step because it's 20 minutes in for the podcast almost, more or less. And we haven't really asked the pub quiz questions yet, but we did set up the scene because we talked a little bit about the antibodies and a little bit about the allergies. I guess brain health will fit very well. So 
Right now, ladies, my usual request is for you to ask the questions and remember, listeners, the answer only at the end of the podcast. So, Aurélie, can you start with your question? What are the potential risk and benefit of allergies in relation to brain disease or disorders? Okay, great. So we have one question and then we have the second one from Heather. How many therapeutic antibodies are currently approved by the FDA or the EMA? That's the American and European Drug Approval Associations. And of those therapeutic antibodies, how many are for cancer treatment? Okay, great. So we have a number and we have a bit of a more open question to discuss. And I can't wait to learn what the answers are. Before we discuss a little bit your field, Aurélie, I wanted to come back to the antibodies because I was just wondering, Heather, when you're creating these uh, therapeutic antibodies, what is the amount that you actually create and need to use in the immune system? How does it look really? How much do we need to give a patient for it to be yeah, used? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Or how much do we need to make to research it? Both. I think both is very interesting, yes. Well, let me start from the beginning then. So the research, we start our antibody research looking at the antibodies in the lab and looking at how they behave with cells, immune cells and cancer cells. And we call that in vitro research. We then move to in vivo where we perform animal models. And we are now in the amazingly exciting position that we've just completed the first in class phase one clinical trial of MOV18 and published those results last year. So first in class, because an IgE has never been developed as a therapeutic before and never been given to humans before. And phase one being the first type of trial. So it's a very small trial, mainly looking at safety, but we can also look at whether there are any anti-cancer effects. So in, in the whole of that process, I mean, the first publication on MOV18 IgE by my supervisor, uh, Professor Sophia Karagianis, was published in 1999, and we published the results of the phase one trial last year in 2023. So that gives you an idea of the time. So we're generating a lot of antibody over that time to research it. Um, but very small amounts, maybe a quarter of a gram of antibody gives us enough to do quite a lot in the lab. And then when we go to patients, we need a lot more. But actually, in fact, in our clinical trial, because of IgE being so novel and us take, being very cautious, particularly because IgE is known to have roles in allergy, the question of safety was a very, very big one. We were incredibly cautious and started with incredibly low doses. So actually, in, in our clinical trial, patients got up to 12 milligrams doses, which actually when it comes to immunotherapy is, is very, very low. You mentioned that this is the first time you actually developed uh, such a I IG antibody as a therapeutic. Why only now? What's the reason that people did not do it before? <laughs> well, I think people weren't thinking across their discipline. I don't think people were considering IgE, what how powerful it can be and how potent it is when it comes to, to mediating allergic reactions and also fighting parasites and understanding that perhaps it has these very potent effects and we might be able to specifically target cancer. I think it comes from people like Sophia Karagianis and Professor Hannah Gould looking outside of their field and, and discussing their work with others. And I think it's really coming from these epidemiological studies because there is also a long list of studies demonstrating that some individuals with really low IgE level in the body have a higher risk of development of cancer overall. And so this is where I think the original idea came. And uh, Professor Karadjanis uh, have a long list of studies to clearly characterize it side by side that IgE is more potent than IgG to activate effector cells to 
kill the cancer. So I think this is really impressive and it's amazing that they reach already this level to develop this into the clinic and we are really looking forward for the development. Of course. You mentioned this is ovary cancer. What's the reason for, for this cancer and not other ones? Ovarian cancer is a solid tumor. There's a huge unmet need. Patients are often diagnosed at late stage and there aren't very many therapeutic options. And certainly when the research started, immunotherapy for ovarian cancer didn't exist. But when our research actually doesn't only focus on ovarian cancer, we, we have preclinical studies and we've published now another second in class antibody, which targets tumor associated antigens. So that protein expressed very highly by melanoma and we really want to explore how far we can go with this. I don't think this is an approach that is only relevant for ovarian cancer. I think it could be recapitulated for a broad range of cancers. Yes, definitely. You have to start somewhere, right? I guess this is the same approach for glioma. The reason could be that it's just really extremely difficult and, uh, you know, you, you, you don't really have any cures yet. <laughs> so that's why, why not start there, right? You have to choose. Yes, specifically, you, you have to clarify the target. And this is where it's really important to clarify which target is the right one because you don't want that the target is not specific for the cancer and then you lead to autoimmunity and uh, to avoid side effects. And I think what is also uh, moving on is the characterization of new Uh, what we call tumor associated antigen. So this is the flag. Hey, oh, I'm a cancer cell. Recognize me. And this is also where we would like to characterize new antigens, maybe thanks to this concept of allergo oncology. Because if IgE is really protective, what are their targets? And this is still something we don't know. This is the moment we should be finishing. That's not such a nice question to finish, but I don't want to finish yet because I have a few things to ask you as well still, because I mentioned glioma, but I think maybe some people don't know. I did have an interview quite some time ago with your colleague from LIH, Anna Goembieska, about glioblastoma glioma, but I assume not everyone is such a big fan of the podcast that they've listened to all the episodes. So for those ones who don't know, What is this cancer? Why are we looking at it? So we, we look at glioma. So glioma is a malignant brain tumor, is the most frequent, and it's highly heterogeneous. So some glioma are progressing slowly, some of them are progressive really fast and having an infiltration within the brain parenchyma. The most frequent is this aggressive type that infiltrates the brain, and it's called glioblastoma. Why it's important to look at this tumor? Because there is no cure. We talk a lot about the power of IgE, but in the brain tumor, thanks to our model of uh, allergies that are protective against the development of this type of aggressive tumor, we also realize that in the context of allergy, the brain immunity is all, all also modulated. So the cellular immunity seems to be more potent to react against the emerging tumor. So this is also interesting to note. So we have myeloid cells inside the brain that are called microglia. And in the group of uh, neuroimmunology at LIH, we are really into this study of these immune cells to know how we can target the anti-tumoral feature. And it seems that investigating on the mechanism of oh, allergy modulate brain immunity could potentially be translated into innovative therapy. And it's especially crucial because glioma is definitely one of those tumors that can actually reprogram the immune system. Exactly. And it's quite specific to brain tumor. So you have huge impact on overall immunity. So the body guardians are really slowed down by the growing of the tumor. So this is why immunotherapeutics are, are not working because immunotherapeutics are there to strengthen your immunity. But if you don't have immunity, the immunotherapeutic is useless. So this is why it's important for us to further delineate how allergy could foster this anti-tumoral immunity. So I think after this discussion, our listeners will know quite a lot about IgE. I don't know, we didn't count how many times we said IgE, but it was a lot. And they will remember that there's some amazing research going on, both in the UK and in Luxembourg. But uh, I was just wondering, what is the space we should look for? So what's the future? What's the next thing for you, Heather? 
Well, the future is that MOV18 is now going to be going into the next stage of trial. It's called a phase 1B. So it will be in many more patients. We've, in the phase one, we treated or enrolled 26 patients onto the trial. So the next study will be much broader. And actually, that's now being led by a spin out company from King's College London called Epsilogen, who fund me. And I'm supporting them to really try to expand the portfolio of IG therapeutics against other cancers and trying to really understand the mechanisms behind it. What is IG doing? What does it do differently to IgG? There's so much we don't know. And in terms of allergo oncology, I think we've talked about that we have these four active task forces as part of the IACI working group. Aureli leads one, and I'm sure she'll tell you a bit more about that, but I work with a colleague, Mariona Pascal, on another one where we're focusing on granular sites, so some of these specific effector cells, which we know are activated by IgE, and we're trying to work collaboratively to understand what we want to learn about those from both an allergy and oncology perspective. Okay, sounds very exciting and interesting. What about you, Aurélie? What's the next thing? So the next thing is to further decipher on the mechanism thanks to our MOS model. Also, with the task force we are conducting, so I think we are also here to discuss about this need to have a better stratification when we refer to this association between allergy and cancer because over the year there is a lack of clear definition of which type of allergy would be actually having an effect positive or negative on which type of cancer and which type of cancer when we refer for example to brain tumor I already tell you there is glioma and inside glioma there is several subtypes and it's important now to when the next generation allergo oncology study would be done to really uh, clarify on the biomarker for allergy and for the tumor. You gave me exactly the word I still wanted to talk about because I have a feeling whenever I have people from <laughs> yes. LIH or any other you know, medical specialist, there's always the moment of biomarkers. Yes. <laughs> and I've had it defined already so many times, but I still struggle. What is actually a biomarker? Yes, and yes. Why is it so important? Why are we always looking for biomarkers? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but we, we already touched upon a biomarker because IG is a biomarker to characterize allergy. And uh, we already touched upon biomarker when we refer to tumor associated antigen. So, a biomarker is a biological determinant that allows for defining the risk of cancer, defining who will benefit for a specific therapy, and to also help doctors to define how patients will respond to a treatment, and then also to follow the response to treatment. Ideally, a biomarker should come from blood test. Every a year, you do your annual check and you look for the white blood cells. So any kind of marker that you see in the list of your blood check is a biomarker. And the important for us in this field is maybe to clarify and to find new biomarkers that could help to characterize the risk and then to define the prognosis and response to treatment. And it basically means that you can say then high levels of this mean that, ideally, of course, it, because it, that's ideally, very simplifying yes. things. It, it's simplifying things, but if you go to the right stratification, we can reach this point. And here we come to the personalized medicine approach. Of course. So there's really, as you say, stratification, it's not only the fact that you need to find, okay, which cancer and which allergy, but also which patient, right? Yes. And we go again because you re really don't know. That's why you, of course, have big studies to kind of check as much as possible. So we talked about stratification and it just reminds me of this name, Stratelin, <laughs> of the task force. Yeah. Is that related? Yes, of course. So this is an initiative inside the working group of allergo oncology. So we can to this point, looking at the literature, that there is a lack of stratification. So the, the thing we discussed together. So this is why we created the uh, Stratalon Task Force that I'm leading together with uh, Michelle Turner from um, Barcelona in Spain. And uh, we are lucky to have regroup multidisciplinary team or 30 experts in the field of allergy immunology, neuro-oncology, so specifically for glioma, and also data scientists. 
And we have published uh, recently a position paper where we did the ground of what we know. So all this epidemiological study. And then we delineate what is a biomarker for brain tumor? What is a biomarker for allergy? And we draw the line for future research in allergo oncology. And we raised all the open questions in the field. So it's for us a roadmap to be followed for the next generation allergo oncology studies. And of course, we will share the link to the paper in the show notes. So if someone wants to expand their knowledge and maybe get, get in the field, right? Of course. Think, oh, this question is so interesting. I want to do the research. Why not? Of course. And we are open for collaboration. And uh, I think this is the beauty of our work to be able to interact with a different kind of expert. And I feel really thankful of being able to interact and to get to know Heifer and all the People from the working group, I think for scientists and young scientists as we are, it's really amazing. Yes, of course it is. I totally agree with you. And I think this is really, unfortunately, the only moment to go back to the pub quiz questions. I mean, not the only one, not, not that I don't want to solve them. Of course I do. But, but I'm just thinking that as usual, I always complain about the same thing. And I promise myself I will not, that there is not enough time, but there is never enough time to get really deep in, right? And you always have a feeling you're just scratching the surface. And you both, I'm sure, feel, oh, I didn't say this and that. And we didn't talk about that. And she didn't ask this important question. But now going back to the antibodies and brain health. So first of all, Heather, can you remind our listeners what the question was and now the answer to it as well? How many therapeutic antibodies were approved by the FDA or EMA and how many are for cancer treatment? So there are 206 therapeutic antibodies currently approved um, for use across all all therapeutic areas. And of those, 96 are for cancer. So that's almost half, 47%. So that sounds like a lot, but I don't want that to suggest that there isn't work to do. I think we've talked a lot today about the need for more um, therapeutics and the need to diversify our approach. That's what we're trying to do. And now that you told me all this, I'm going to ask are they all IgG antibodies? The vast then? majority of those 96 are IgG. Some are, if you remember the body of an antibody, some are just the arms. So some might be the top part of the body with two arms or some might just be one arm. But the vast majority are that whole antibody body um, with the arms and the body down to the legs and being IgG. I need to ask, how is it possible to just use one arm to do something. I mean, I thought you ha you need the full antibody for it to work. They might not be what you would class as an um, immunotherapy. So they might have a direct effect against the cancer and not necessarily be engaging the immune system. But some are bispecific. Um, some with the two arms can engage an immune cell and the cancer cell. The 96 are quite diverse. Um, so we could yes. speak for an hour on that if we wanted to. <laughs> Of course, that's next time. I always <laughs> say that next time for sure. And now for you, Aurélie, what was the question and what's the answer? So the question was, what have potential risks and benefits of allergies in relation to brain disease or disorder? So I ask this question because often when I explain my research to my parents and friends, they say, oh, well, I'm allergic, so I'm protected against the risk of cancer or brain tumor. And often I say, yeah, but it's not so easy because we know that having an allergy is also associated with higher risk of having neuroinflammatory disease such as Alzheimer, Parkinson, and it's also known that children with allergy have more learning disabilities. So in, it's actually part of our working hypothesis that allergy modulate brain immunity that is beneficial in one case, reducing brain tumor, but detrimental in on other case, inducing neuroinflammation. So you're not giving me any good news to finish with. <laughs> yes, the, the good news is that we are increasing the state of knowledge and we may be able to understand better the balance of it. But it's also kind of leads back to the whole discussion of balance, right? If you know, recently I had uh, actually 
specialist in immunotherapy as mm. well here in the podcast, a uh, resident in oncology uh, at Seychelles in Luxembourg. And exactly, it was, you know, I always say this boring discussion of balanced diet that is so important, <laughs> right? But yes, balance somehow seems to be the solution, but it's not always liked as the, it just seems too easy or too difficult in some cases, right? We would prefer a pill with all the antibodies or whatever yeah. else that could just cure everything, <laughs> right? Thank you so much today, Heather and Aurelie, for coming and uh, keep up the good work. And I'll be really watching the space and sharing with our listeners what is happening in Allergo Oncology. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. This is it for today. Thank you so much for listening, for, as usual, contacting us. Remember that you can do that on all the social media. We're present there. We promote our episodes. We're always open for suggestions of new guests or questions or whatever you want to share with us. And this was Silax, and my name is Hanna Szymaszko.